Well, welcome. For those of you who don't know, my name is Pastor Mark Oliver. I am the pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. And on behalf of the entire congregation, welcome. Uh, welcome uh, as, as we gather here to, um, I believe, a very pivotal moment in our city, a very important time in our city, uh, a Kairos moment, as I was saying when we were right before we were praying, uh, because there are many, many lives, many, many lives that will be uh, perhaps different um, depending on the, uh, the vote on May 12th. So welcome. A few uh, administrative things. Uh, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with our building, uh, we have um, right near the door where you came in, the main door, there is a, 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 a kind of a unisex bathroom, handicapped bathroom right there. Um, but if that is occupied, if there's a long, long line there, there are some restrooms in other parts of the building, primarily a main one downstairs. Just ask for them to lead you there and they'll, they'll point you in the right, in the right direction. Um, we want get, to uh, get started. Uh, for those of you uh, who are a part of Trinity, I've been saying this all along, so please forgive me, but I've been telling our folks that um, in many ways on, on May 12th, um, we're going to be making a decision of really ultimately in whom do we trust? In whom do we trust? Do we believe? And do we, do we trust in, in the God of chance? Or do we trust in the true and living God? And, and, and I think that's something to keep in mind as we consider uh, all of the, the evidence, all of what we're ultimately uh, pondering and weighing out and thinking about. Um, because for me, ultimately, is about uh, where is our trust? Who is our trust really in? And uh, that's ultimately uh, the bottom line. Um, before I have uh, uh, Pastor uh, Bishop Felipe Texera come and pray for us, um, I also want to let folks know there is a, a, a book by Mr. Robert H. Steele uh, called The Curse, Big Time Gambling Seduction of a Small New England Town. Uh, they are available. They are available. Um, it's a novel, uh, but, but um, it just strikes right to the core of, um, in many ways, what's really going on in the gaming industry and what can happen to a community uh, when, uh, when gaming, the gaming industry comes to town. Um, if you are interested, we do have a few advanced copies. There's a back table there. They're $15 each. If you would like to grab one, I think it would be well worth your while. All right. Let's, let's begin. Bishop Felipe, would you come and lead us in prayer? Brothers and sisters, let us pray. To you, O oh Lord, we are grateful that you brought us here today, this evening, because you give us a mind and conscience to care for our brothers and sisters who down the line will suffer if this go true. You know very well, Lord, the, the pain and suffering of our people here in Brockton. So many broken houses, so many addicted to drugs and others, and we ask you to bless us with the compassion to care for the voiceless of our city. To protect those who don't speak the language, who are not aware what's going on in our city of Brockton. Lord, I'm here to ask you to guide us. Our broken hearts, despair, fear, Lord, just now in South Carolina, a brother was killed, unarmed. Our hearts are broken by our divisions. But those who want to win the world and see the poor to be the poorest of the world, come to us this evening as Christians that believe in the risen Christ. We ought to brought love to one another by standing for what's right on May 12th. May the Holy Spirit come upon us tonight and bless us and bless our pastor and all the members of this church. And let us proclaim the goodness 
of salvation to all our brothers and sisters in Brighton. Amen. Amen. Hello to everyone. Welcome. I'm Jill Wiley, and I serve as a community minister at Messiah Baptist Church. And my purpose is to walk us through the program a little bit so you'll know what's coming. And thank you so much uh, for offering the prayer and uh, for leading us and getting us started in your hosting here at Trinity, Pastor Mark. We're going to start with why we're here, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can all become experts. And then Isabel Lopez, who is from Brockton Interfaith Community, will give us a rousing uh, cheer about awakening the community. Following that, Les Brunel has joined us. He's come, he works in Washington, D.C. And then we'll have a presentation by him because he is, in my mind, the world's expert on uh, stopping predatory gambling and explaining to the rest of us what it is. And we'll have a question and answer. And the way that we're going to do that is that we've tried to supply paper. There are little question boxes on the uh, ledges over there. You can wave to somebody who will help you, or you can write it on the back of a piece of paper. But any question you have, and we'll gather them up and try to cover all the topics that are raised. And uh, we'll give them to Les, and Pastor Mark will moderate that section. And then we're going to have a moving forward and next steps with Pastor Reed, who's already on the job with voter lists and yard signs and banners and things like that, the real uh, hardcore things that you do when you're trying to state your case. And then we'll close and then there's perhaps a bit of time that if there are other questions you have or signing up uh, on pledge cards and other ways to become part of this effort. So I think in the next 45 minutes, the, uh, your uh, Nerves will be touched by what we learn and how fast we have to learn so much. That's why I said we all have to become experts. It was uh, on February when the snows were piling up around Brockton, and we might have all had a little more time to read our paper, that uh, I noticed that they, a casino proposal had come for across the street from the high school at the fairgrounds. And I, my hair might have stood on end. I couldn't believe it. So I called the one person I knew who could uh, tell me about it, and it was Les Brunel in Washington. And I said, guess what? And I'm so, so, so maybe all of you have had that aha experience, or oh no experience, which is where did this come from? And it's come very rapidly. And so we all have to just kind of have the steepest learning curve ever to understand gambling, because it is a new thing in the last generation. And that's what Les is going to tell us about, and others, as we develop our program tonight. One thing we can do as faith-based people is to uh, turn to our roots and to understand what, what we do know and what we've learned about the way people treat each other and how we're called to uh, uh, be in this world. And so I would like to just capture my thoughts in terms of over the next 36 days, because the election, the special referendum is 36 days from tomorrow, um, and that's not long. We have to think, we have to pray, and we have to vote. So if you need anything when you're sitting, what do I have to do? I have to think, I have to pray, I have to vote. And we want to give you those opportunities. Tonight, you're going to get information. And there's an amazing amount of information, especially on stoppredatorygambling.org, which uh, keeps a steady supply coming. So you do become an expert. Then you have to become a, an ethical expert and be able to articulate faith. And the way that we think the best way to feel comfortable and supported in faith is to launch to, uh, today, really, and starting tomorrow right here at Trinity Baptist, a community call to prayer. So seven churches have volunteered to be available one each day of the week for a particular period of time. And we try to outline it so it's perfectly clear in here that on any given day, if you want to join a group of people or join an existing prayer group to to pray about this issue, to pray for guidance, to pray for our city, that's possible. So we thank Messiah Baptist, Brockton Assembly of God, Our Lady of Lords, the Adoration Chapel, Trinity Baptist, Converged Christian Center here, Central United Methodist Church, the Haitian Church of God at 80 Pleasant Street, and Overcomer Center, which is 48 Green Street. And this outlines exactly what times 
those occasions will be. It'll be like 30 minutes. And uh, my commitment and my discipline will be to sort of steward this and make sure, but the pastors have consented. In some cases, you're joining existing groups. But just know, if, you, if it overwhelms you or you reach a point where you just need to connect, we all need to connect through prayer. And then, you know, through all of this, 35 days, we hope to dis disseminate the information necessary about getting people registered to vote by April 22nd and to the polls on May 12th. But in the meantime, by thinking, praying, and then voting, we can approach this in a holistic way, in a substantive way, and in a deep way that will keep our community casino free. So I'd like to invite Isabel to uh, give a perspective that she has about how the community is, is more or less lying there like a sleeping giant to come and uh, respond to this issue. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Isabel Lopez, and I am the lead organizer at the Brockton Interfaith Community. And this is the time that we need to awake our community. There is time to listen, to educate, and to activate, to put our faith into action. This is the time. There is not going to be any other time. We are working towards the goal of May 12. And if we are all committed to understand that a casino in Brockton will bring but no harm to the community. When we talk about the casino, we're talking about putting our people in suffering for profit. Do we, are we here to care for the community, for our brothers and sisters? Are we here for that? Yes. Because the casino has proven that right now, who is gonna be gambling in Brockton is the people that live in Brockton. With three casinos already, one in Everett and Rhode Island in Connecticut. How many people are gonna be driving to Brockton to gamble in Brockton? And I know that there was a gaming law that was passed, but we need to be assured that casino will not be happening in Brockton at all. Are we, are we have that, are we in favor of that? Yeah. That a casino will not be happening in Brockton? In a broken city like Brockton, where we are facing so you know addiction, we are facing foreclosure, we are facing job loss, and revenue. Many uh, politicians will say, revenue. Are we? Can we put our people for profit? <laughs> Casino revenue comes from problematic gamblers, people that lost lose their money. So 40% of the revenue from the casino comes from people that have lost their money. And how people feel about losing their money? Do they feel happy? Who is behind them? Their kids, their families, their wives suffering because they have addiction problem. And how many people feel happy when they have addiction problems? And what about the, the children, the, the students? at the high school. Casinos uh, in, in Connecticut um, also improves that 40% uh, in, in Connecticut, the arrest made after the casino was open increased 40% the arrest made in, the, in, in that city. So are we ready to see more people be incarcerated? We already have so many people in the city of Brockton with quarries they have been incarcerated, they are suffering because they cannot find jobs, because they have quarries. And so, you know, we need to put into account all of these things. So we need, this is the time. This is about the time for all of us to come together and put our faith into action, to listen, to educate, to be there with each other, but more importantly, to make sure that we address these issues very seriously. 
Because if we're not doing our work, and then later on, who is going to be helping us? Who is going to be helping us? You know, we're going to be confronting, you know, everything that is going to come. And then, you know, more social services and so forth. But we don't want to see that. We want to see a healthy community, healthy families, because we care about this community, don't we? So all the burden that is coming, we have to say no, first of all, because it's located, it's gonna be located right in a high school, unless they can plan to move the high school far away. That's impossible, so we have to defend our youth, the future of this community. Because if we are setting up a casino right in front of a high school, that means that we are putting our youth to be uh, become gamblers as well. And we don't want to do that because we are people of faith. We are people that we build this community and we want the best for our community. So I, I will say that, you know, um, pray, put your faith into an action, and make sure you educate the community. And most important is that to all of us together, we're going to have a plan. We need to have a plan for May 12th. We are going to be having a series of uh, community formational events where we all gonna come together. The next one is on the 14th. May, May 14th is gonna be the next one. Um, two, April, April. Sorry. April 14th, next Tuesday, is gonna be the next citywide where we hope to bring more people because one, when we are united, we are one. We are one united and one in Jesus Christ. So thank you so much, because I know that our faith calls us to be here. And this is, I hope that many of you will leave tonight with a lot of education and some insights on how to put your faith into an action to educate those that still need this kind of information and education. Thank you. Quick word to introduce Les. Uh, as I say, he's the world's expert in my eyes. He was the uh, expert on, the, uh, on Beacon Hill when he worked as chief of staff to former state senator Sue, Susan Tucker, who every, was the go-to gal for uh, keeping gambling out of Massachusetts, and in large part due, I'm sure, to the support and, uh, that Les gave to all of us. So thank you, Les. Thanks for coming for coming at the, he was willing to come on March 3rd. And I said, I, at the moment I haven't talked to anybody yet, Les. So here you are and boy are we glad. Thank you. All right, good evening everyone. So my name is Les Burnell, and I'm the National Director of Stop Predatory Gambling, which is based in Washington, D.C. And our mission is to end government-sponsored gambling because it creates unfairness and inequality in our society. That's our mission. But what really prompted me to this issue, this issue became a calling for me. I, I grew up in Massachusetts. That's what you, what's, what's special about this event tonight is I grew up in Massachusetts in a city very similar uh, and I still live in a city very similar to Brockton. I'm from the city of Lawrence. Many of you know. Uh, and actually, when I drove around Brockton today, I'm like, why would they ever think of a casino for Brockton? I mean, you guys have a lot going for you here. You know, I, I live, Lawrence has a lot of challenges. I'm very proud to be in Lawrence. I've been there for almost 20 years now. I've been very active in that community. But it just, it's, it's incredible to me that a community with this much going for it would, would contemplate this public, this public policy. Uh, so this issue became a calling for me after I worked in the Massachusetts Senate where, you know, for me, you know, government-sponsored gambling was like the paint on the wall. You know, I never questioned it. You know, the, the lottery's been around my whole life. Uh, you know, and casinos w was something that people had talked about a little bit, and, and I happened to work for a state senator who was opposed to casinos. And from that experience, I began to learn about this issue. And it was one of those issues where the more you learn about it, you're like, do people really understand this? You know, like I had gambled before, I'd, I'd bought an occasional lottery ticket, I'd been to a casino a couple times. But like, when you really begin to understand like how this business works and that at its core, this is a, a public policy, a government program, it begins to really, you know, question, you know, 
where we're going as a country, as a community, but as a country. So tonight I put together a few slides to kind of hopefully educate you. And I want you to understand, when you walk out of here tonight, one of the, one of the things I hope you leave with is that I, I've made this issue my life's work. So I left a normal career about seven years ago. I had a cushy job, made a good, you know, good money, my, my career track. I actually wanted to run for mayor in the city where I lived. I, had a, I have a master's in public administration that I, I wanted to become the guy that kind of turned around the city of Lawrence. And that was my life's ambition. But I, I learned so much about this issue that this became a calling for me. And, and at the time, I didn't associate it to a, a faith calling, but over the last several years, the more I got into this, it really is, you know, I, I feel like God's called me to do this. And so many of you who, who have a calling, I think you can appreciate that. Uh, but I think, in my view, this is, when, 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 and this is a nonpartisan issue, but when, so I'm going to mention, you know, Senator Elizabeth Warren, when she stands up and says, you know, the system is rigged against middle class and, and low income folks, this issue is the poster child for that message. So I'm gonna, it's going to go for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then I'll get into a hot question and answer, okay? But, uh, and I, I get, if I talk too fast at times, just raise your hand and say, let's slow it down. Because you can see, I, I'm very fired up about this issue, and I think when I'm done with that, I hope you, you share that passion. So here's my first slide. Because when you grow up in Lawrence, you know, what you hear about, you know, we live in Lawrence, we hear about Brockton. It's like, this is the city of champions. I mean, this is, this is think of that brand. You're the city of champions. For my whole life, growing up in high school, like, it was a great sports town. Like, this is the city of champions. Okay. So I thought about that. I first heard of Casino. It's just, it was just such a contrast. So I just want you to see, like, put up, like, you bring in a casino. Look at what you're doing. You say, Brockton, city of losers. That's what you're doing. And that's not my word, losers. Because if there's one moment that really kind of hooked me on this issue about 10 years ago. Okay, hold on a second. I point to there. Bear with me here. Okay, there we go. If there's one issue that, that one moment that kind of hooked me on this is I was reading a, a, the New York Times Magazine, Sunday Magazine, did a big expose on slot machines, okay? Incredible story, you know, and now it's even better stuff that's been written since then. But for then, that was kind of a big deal. No one had really take, taken a hard look at it. And the reporter was a name, guy, guy named Gary Rivlin. So Gary Rivlin is walking around IGT, which is a company you'll, you'll hear a little bit about over the next four weeks. IGT stands for International Gaming Technology, and they're the folks that make the slot machines. And slot machines is where the money is. Roughly 70 to 80% of the casino revenue comes from slot machines. It's all about the machines. So here the reporter's walking through IGT out in Nevada, and one of the questions he's asking the, the employees is, you know, do you play the machines that you make? And to a person, they said, no, we don't play the machines. And then he went up to one final guy, one guy that designed the machines, and he said to him, listen, do you play these machines that you make? And here's what he said to a New York Times reporter. You can read it, but I just love saying it because it just fires me up every time I say it. He, said, he says, he first, he spit on the floor. Slots are for losers. Think about that. He makes the machines. He thinks of his customers as losers. Slots are for losers. Okay? So here we have, not just here in Massachusetts, but across the United States, state governments and local municipalities pushing these machines onto their citizens. They're sponsoring machines that their own makers don't play them, and they, just, they call them, it's for, it's for losers. So if you, if you believe in equality, if you believe in fairness, if you love other people, you know, if you try to practice what Jesus teaches to love others like he loves us, like, you can't, there's no way you can support this issue. This is a public policy that turns all of us into losers. And you'll see why when I'm done here. But that's a signature quote. All right. So what you, what you learned, so what, that hooked me on. So the more I began to learn about this, once you, you know, kind of dig below the surface, you realize this public policy is built on sand. That's why they do it. That's why they come out just a month, you know, roughly a few weeks before you have this vote and they announce this big deal. They don't want a lot of sunshine on this public policy. Okay? That's why they're going to send, you know, they're going to drop, you know, probably, you know, and Steve Wynn and Everett dropped a million dollars on their campaign. And you're going to get, they're going to spend probably at least, probably close to that here in Brockton, you know, in that range, a million dollars to push this through. Something that supposedly the people want, right? But the reason they have to do that is they have to develop a phony narrative. A phony narrative. And it, by, I mean a phony story that this is somehow going to create jobs for people, somehow going to provide this incredible new revenue source for city government. Because they don't want you asking the real questions. Okay, so 
government's experiment with casinos has failed. Okay? That's what you learned. This has been ex a, 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 a failed experiment. Okay? Because number one, it's dishonest. Okay? It's dishonest. Okay? When something is dishonest, people talk about it dishonestly. They, they, you'll have these phony, oh, it's going to do this. It's going to, you know, bring back money, you know, from some, supposedly going out of state. It's going to, you know, fund all these new things for the community. You know, you talk about it dishonestly because it's, at its core, it's a dishonest thing. You know, and I'm, I'm going to spend a little time talking about why it's dishonest. But that's a core message. It's dishonest. And you should actually be part of your core talking point. Okay. Secondly, it's financially damaging to city, to citizens. You know, it's financially damaging to citizens. There's a reason why Massachusetts, you know, and, and most states had prohibitions on commercial casino gambling. Okay? Because it's illegal to cheat and exploit people. And so it's illegal. And now we've, le we've legalized it for the short term, okay? But only if government's a partner to it. So you and I can't go up at our own casino. All right, all of you, all those who stand up, oh, this is like a free market. This is a business. These guys get a regional monopoly. This is no business. They operate with a special privilege courtesy of government, okay? So it's, it's, it's financially damaging to citizens. And that's why for most of American history, we haven't been in this business. We haven't, this has not been a public policy. And lastly, okay, and this is really goes to the heart of the issue, whether you're Republican or Democrat, okay, we're having a national debate, a national conversation about what we've defined as the defining challenge of our times, and that is the rising unfairness and inequality in America today. Brockton's suffering from that. Lawrence is suffering from that. Pretty much every community in this country is facing this as a challenge, okay? The evidence is overwhelming that casinos are contributing to the rising unfairness and inequality in our country. And it's going to make Brockton more unfair, okay, create more unfairness here and more inequality in your community. And not just for those people who go to the casino. I just want to make sure that's clear. We, we talk a lot about the addicted gamblers. That's a big part of it. But two-thirds of the American public and roughly two-thirds of citizens here in Brockton rarely ever gamble. It, this is about turning you into losers also. You lose from this. Okay, even if you don't play. Okay. So this one, you, you can't really see because of the lighting, unfortunately. But par part of the dishonesty of this public policy, okay, what that is, that's a picture, that's a chart, okay, on the left that was taken from a book called Addiction by Design, who's, which, was, which was authored by an MIT professor named Natasha Schull, okay? Natasha Schull was on 60 Minutes, okay, talking about electronic gambling machines. is really someone who deeply influenced me to kind of leave a normal life and work on this issue. Her research, her writing about how, how slot machines work really is, is incredible. But what that chart to the left shows is that if there's like three different machines and over the course of like, you know, three or 4,000 spins, the machine is designed to make you lose money. Like, even if you win the short term, the longer you play that machine, you're gonna lose your money, okay? That's what's dishonest about it. That's why slot machines are, are illegal unless you get a special license from state government to do it, okay? And we're doing it in the name of funding, you know, so-called funding public uh, revenues, supposedly. But it's really about prop people are profiting from this, okay? These, these billionaires are making money from it, okay? But that's what makes it, the, the product itself is dishonest, okay? It's a rigged machine, all right? And not only is the machine rigged the more you play it, these machines, as with MIT professor Shell taught us, is that these machines now are designed so you can't stop playing them. The whole experience of playing these slot machines is designed so you physically can't stop playing. No matter who you are, whether you're rich or poor, these machines are designed, the whole experience, so you can't stop playing them. So on the one hand, mathematically, you're guaranteed to lose your money the longer you play them, and at the same time, the machine experience, and the whole casino experience is designed to keep you there and playing as long as possible. So that's dishonest. Okay? What's dishonest about this is, is we hear about, you know, we're going to have all this new revenue you know, falling out of the sky for Brockton and, you know, you pay even if you don't play, okay? You pay even if you don't play, okay? And this quote appears from the best independent study that's been done on this issue over the last 10 years in terms of the revenues, the public revenues generated from, from government-sponsored gambling like casinos, from predatory gambling, is it was done by SUNY Albany, has a Rockefeller Institute, and they did a study, they analyzed all the states and all the revenues that come in. What, what government gambling does, what especially casinos do, is they make your, your, your budget situation worse. 
they make it worse. They don't improve it. Short term, you get a little bit of money coming in, a new influx of money. But over the long term, you pay for this. You, you the non-gambler, you pay higher taxes because of this for less services. Because this is a revenue stream, it doesn't go up. As, your, as Brockton's economy grows, your, you know, your property taxes go up, other forms of revenue go up to the city. Excise, all that stuff goes up, okay? Gambling revenue, the only way gambling revenue goes up is you have to bring in new and more extreme forms of gambling. Okay, and you see that, if anyone who questioned it, look, your own, our own state lottery went from a dollar a week ticket, now we're selling $30 scratch tickets, you know? And the lottery's part, I'm not gonna talk about the lottery tonight, but just so you know, those of you who say, well, what about the lottery? The lottery's a total ripoff. That's a, that's a debate for another day, all right? Total ripoff. Don't let anyone tell you we have the lottery so you should accept casinos, okay? The lottery's a failed policy, and just because we have a failed policy, that already have a failed policy, doesn't mean you should bring another one in on top of it, okay? But, but so I just wanna read you this fact. So income from casinos does not tend to grow over time as rapidly as general tax revenue. Expenditures in education and other programs will generally grow more rapidly than gambling revenue over time. So thus, new gambling operations intended to pay for increases in government spending add to, they add to, uh, rather than ease, long-term budget problems. Well, short, oh, just over two or three, you look at any state, any place that's bringing this, probably over the last two or three years, you get your initial influx of dollars, but, it, but it, you know, so let's say, I don't know what the, the exact amount that Brockton's gonna bring in, the sh in the initial, what, 10 million, whatever, 5 million, what's the number? 10 million, it sounds great, because it sounds great, right? It's, too, it's, you know, 10 million is a great number to put into a brochure, so that's what they tell you what you're gonna get, okay? But after that, after that, after that time, t you know, that, that money's gonna be built into to Brockton's budget, and guess what? When all these other new casinos open up and, and as revenues go down, as they burn through all these people locally who are addicted gamblers, those revenues to the city are gonna, gonna go down. So now all of a sudden the city of Brockton's built in $10, more, $10 million into their budget annually, but now that revenue source is going up. Where do you think they're gonna turn to to pay for that? You all, I mean, people, all the people who don't gamble. That's why this is a ripoff. Every state in this country, coast to coast, who's embraced this as a public policy, every community, all these communities, they say this revives. I've been in 150 communities that have casinos in this, in this country. Okay, they all say the same exact message. No one in these communities, have, none of these communities have been revived. It's a total ripoff. And that's why they spend so much money to tell you this phony narrative, okay? So we can talk more about that. During a question and answer, we can get into more of that. But that's an important question. They build it into the budget, and then it doesn't deliver, and then you're not paying for it. So, yes, ma'am, thank you, I will. All right, so this is one of my favorite slides, all right? This is one of my favorite slides. So part of the, probably the, the biggest thing of the dishonesty of this public policy, okay, is we hear what a great thing is, this is for Brockton. This is a great thing for you. We're gonna bring this in. It's gonna save your community, okay? We, it's just like going to the movies, going out to dinner, or having a glass of wine. That's the message these guys say, okay? That's what they say. So here we have Meryl Streep, all right? Meryl Streep, you know, famous actress. Meryl Streep watches the movies she makes. She watches them. She, whatever film it is, she watches that movie that she makes. This is the only, casinos are the only product or service where the people that own them and promote them, and most of the public officials that partner with them, they don't gamble. Think about that. What is more dishonest than that? Okay? We call that phenomenon the smartest guys not in the room. You know? Those of you who remember the Enron scandal from a few years ago, they call it the smartest guys in the room. This is the smartest guys not in the room. So Meryl Streep watches her movies. Robert Mondavi, when he was alive, he drank the wine he made. Okay, the local restaurant chef down here, he eats the food he serves. But how about the guys bringing the casino into Brockton? What about that? You think they gamble? Okay. So some of you may not know his name yet, okay, because what we hear is they, they try to use a lot of local people. Right? I saw some four or five local names are going to sponsor the, the casino campaign here. But the guy going to make the money is a guy named Neil Bloom. Okay. Neil Bloom is a, a billionaire from Chicago, owns several casinos around the United States. All right. So do we, think, do we think Neil Bloom, the billionaire, you know, this is good for you, this is good for Brockton, does he gamble? Does any of his, his billions of dollars, does he gamble himself on slot machines and those kinds of things? Okay, so let's get an answer to that question. All right, from the Chicago Tribune, it was asked by a reporter, as Neil Bloom walked through the sophisticated high roller lounge of his newest casino, 
Thursday, in, which is in Des Plaines, Illinois. I asked him, the, re the reporter asked him, do you ever gamble? No, he said. No, he said. Something that is good for you in your town, the billionaire doesn't use it. Okay. it what's more dishonest than that? Okay. So just to kind of touch on a couple other things of how this issue is financially damaging and unfairness. We talked about how it's dishonest. I'm going to touch on now how it's damaging to citizens and how it contributes to rising unfairness and inequality. So the first thing, there is no debate, all right? There's no debate. There's a, we, all the evidence that you see presented by casino, casino interests here, about all the, that's paid for by gambling interests. It's all paid for by gambling interests. It's sponsored by that, okay? We look at research that's not funded by gambling interests. It tells a totally different story, all right? So amount, there's a mounting pile of independent evidence that confirms that casinos are harming health, okay? Rising addiction rates. They're draining wealth from people in the, in the lower ranks of the income distribution. Okay? That's why they target cities like Springfield, Brockton, you know, Fall River, all these places. They target poor communities. Yeah, exactly. Okay? But it's draining, it's extracting wealth from, these, from, from poor folks across the United States, middle income and low income folks. And thirdly, it's contributing to economic in inequality. Okay? Contributing to economic inequality. Wealthy people, they're not going to the casino four or five times a week. Okay, they don't, because they know they're gonna lose their money. They're, they're buying, you know, there's all this data out there how, how people, you know, half, half America doesn't own any stocks, they don't have any pensions, you know. Yet, they're going plant, buying lottery tickets and now many of them are losing all their money, their savings on casinos. Meanwhile, other people, they're saving money for college, 529 funds, they're not, they're not spending money on slot machines. Okay, second thing here, one of the, uh, second factor, that it's contributing to uh, financially damaging to people is this is one of my favorite statistics to talk about. Casinos seriously hurt far more citizens than they employ. Because we hear about this is going to put jobs into Brockton, right? So some of the 600 construction jobs, okay? In Neil Bloom's home state of Illinois, all right, any of you are welcome to pick up the Illinois, call the Illinois Gaming Board tomorrow. That's the, the gambling commission that oversees the state of Illinois. They track the amount of of jobs that the casinos have. They're, they have 10 casinos across the state, and they also track the amount of people that come forward and put themselves on what's called the self-exclusion list. So you, the addict, all right, we, the casino's not gonna cut you off, if, even though if they know you're an addict. You, the addict, have to come in and put yourself on a list. All right, so they call that self-exclusion. So it's, it's part of the phoniness of this whole issue, but the, the, most people don't even put themselves on a, the most people who are addicts, because they're addicts, they don't, they don't have the free will to go in and put themselves on a list. But even though they do, there's still roughly 5% of the population who are addicts, they still do that. They still put themselves on this list. So of that population, there's more than 11,000 citizens today in Illinois who are self-excluded, come forward and say, this, these casinos are ruining my life, okay? Ban me from these things. Guess how many people the state of Illinois employs at casinos? 7,300 folks, okay? There's 25% more people who, who have banned themselves Say this is ruining my life, then there's people who work there. That includes part-time jobs, okay? If that's not the definition of a failed public policy, I don't know what is, all right? And lastly, you know, you're gonna hear a lot about, well, if we don't do it here in Brockton, you know, they're just, they're just gonna go over to Rhode Island, Connecticut, right? It's at $20 million. I heard people, you know, someone mentioned earlier, well, you know, the people of Massachusetts, we t attempted to repeal the law, but the people of Massachusetts, you know, they voted, they voted to keep it in. Well, you'd vote for to keep it in, too. And in this city, many of you voted to keep it in because what you saw on television, those $20 million in advertising, they didn't even mention the word casino. They didn't even mention the word casino. And they're at $20 million of advertising, biggest expenditure on a referendum campaign in Massachusetts history. They don't even mention the word casino. You're going to clean up an environmental site in, in Everett. You know, you're going to rebuild Springfield. I mean, who, who's opposed to that? If you don't gamble, what's, what's the big deal? Of course, it seems like a great thing. The reason why, that's why they spend so much money is they de they're deliberately deceiving the public. All right, so this whole going out of state argument is part of that message, okay? They don't want, no one wants to stand up and say, this is a good thing for Brockton. They want to rationalize it and say, well, we don't, may not like it here, but they're going to go elsewhere if we don't do it. That, that's why we, when something is dishonest, you talk about it dishonestly. Right. And so, because so, really, the, it's an attempt by casinos to evade scrutiny about what they're really doing. And that's inflicting financial damage on citizens, because that's what the business is about. There's a reason why casinos were illegal 
for, for, mo for mu much of American history. All right. So how, how did mayors, you know, you have, a, you have a city here, you have a mayor pushing for this stuff. How did, how did you know, back in the, the, the Great Depression, we look back at the leaders in that time period. You know, they had a world war to fund. You know, they had you know, people, millions of people out of work. You know, they had to fund government, people were broke. Look how easy it would have been for government to stand up and, you know, say, well, let's build casinos, all right? Let's build casinos. But what did they do during the, 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 the 1930s? An era that we now call, what do we call that era? The greatest generation, right? We all heard that term. We call that, that era, the, great, the, the greatest generation, because it was all about service to others, you know? It was about we can do it, right? The iconic image of Rosie the Riveter with her biceps flexed, saying we can do it, okay? Fiorello LaGuardia, some scholars say is the, the most, you know, best mayor in American history, was a famous mayor of New York City. They named an airport after him, okay? You know what he used to do with slot machines, it, you know, because they were cheating people? He'd gather them up across the city, bring them to Rockefeller Center in the heart of Manhattan, and he'd take a sledgehammer to them. He'd smash them, smash the machines, and he'd get, put them on a barge and dump them into New York Harbor. That's what leaders, true leaders, statesmen, used to do with businesses that cheat and exploit people. Okay? They smash the machines, and that's why they were leaders, because they cheat and exploit people. All right? So I'm going to kind of wrap up here with this, with this message to you. So part of me, you know, when I, when I started learning about so much about this issue, I was on a totally different career track. Right? I, I, started, like, I just started to learn so much about this issue. Like, this is so wrong, like that we're doing this as a, as a, as a, as a state government, as local governments, you know? So I, I started really learning, really relearning American history, you know, because before I used to be kind of an in, so-called insider, I used to work in politics. But then the, the way change happens, it really happens outside of state houses. It happens on the outside of city halls. It happens in rooms like this. But, but so this is, to me, this is a, an image that always struck me. And I used to ask myself the question, you know, what drives a person to take action? Even though at first, most observers would think he or she possesses virtually no power. Okay. What drives somebody to do that? What drives somebody to stand in front of a, of a water hose? Okay. What is it? It's a powerful question. And, and I never really understood that until just about six or seven years ago. Okay? And I'm going to tell you what I found. This, this is my, you can't see this. What that says of this is my big secret. Okay? I learned, I developed a, a, a final, I figured this out. I have a big secret, and I'm going to share it with you guys tonight. All right? My big secret is I have royal blood. This Queen Elizabeth, okay? Just like Queen Elizabeth, I have royal blood. You know, there's Princess, Prince William, Princess Kate, you know? And then there's me, <laughs> all right? There's me. Yeah, I don't look like royalty, but you believe it. It's royalty, it's royalty, okay? So I have royal blood, but my royal blood is different than their royal blood. I live in a country that doesn't have kings or queens or princes or princesses. I live in a country where all blood is royal. All blood is royal. And what I'm a part owner of, what I'm a part ruler of, is broken. It's broken. This issue is the Exhibit A on how it's broken. Okay. And the good thing is, I'm not the only one that has royal blood in this room. Okay. So when Jill Wiley stands up at a public meeting in the, over the next four weeks and they say, you know, like, who are you to question these studies we've done? Who are you? We're, we are successful. We are, we're a billion dollar industry. Who are you to question this? You can say this out loud, or at least you can say it to yourself. I have royal blood, and I'm exercising my power. Okay. So, wrap up with these two last thoughts, and then we'll get into more specifics during the Q&A. But I just want to tell you what a vote yes means. You vote yes for a casino. This is what you're saying. Okay. You're saying, number one, a yes vote is it's a vote for more unfairness and more inequality in Brockton, and in your state. A yes vote is a vote for dishonesty. 
It's allowing you and nearly everyone in this city to be cheated, except for a, few, a privileged few. And lastly, a yes vote is a vote for failure. It's a vote for failure. This is a failed experiment. And up there, so that's what you say. You gotta change your brand. A vote yes changes your brand to Brockton City of Losers. What does a vote a, a no a vote no mean? A no vote is a vote for fairness and equality for all Brockton citizens, for everybody. A no vote is a vote for better city government. That's what it's a vote for. This isn't just a referendum on a casino. This is a referendum on your city government. And I tell you right, driving through this community, I know you have your challenges, you're a heck of a lot better off than a lot of urban areas in the United States. You have a lot going for you, and you need to build on those positives. There's a reason why you're the city of champions. A vote, a, a yes vote, I'm sorry, a vote no is a vote that says you care about your neighbors and not just yourself. Right. And lastly, and probably just as important as any of the other ones, is a no vote is a vote that says you really believe, you really believe that Brockton is the city of champions. Yeah. Thank you very much. to do a consultation. Would it be easier because this is a pretty savvy crowd? I think they could just stand up and ask their questions. Would you be willing? Are you? Yeah, because I'm sure you've done this a lot and, and it sounds like people have it. So I think to move things along and not disassemble things and get questions. So, and if you need a break a little bit to compare notes with people, what questions you want, but I would say, You've done this enough that you know how to oh, do absolutely. it. Okay. But thanks, Les. That was great. Yeah, my thanks. <laughs> All right. So, if you have to fire away, I know you can. Yes, sir. Yeah. How do you reconcile most of the people of the Iraq who are pro casino? They're Christians. They believe they go to the church. And the only way in the church is people. How, how do you reconcile that? I don't want to do it. But Socially speaking, you know, then people are sitting down not cues, but they still do it. Yeah. Well, and I just want to make something clear. Like, uh, 10 years ago, I wouldn't say I was pro casino. I, I just didn't have any idea. Like, so I, I think I, I, a lot of people say, I don't think mo most people. No one in, in Brockton was pounding the table for a casino. Okay? Th this is being forced on you. This is, this is no, I mean, you know, they, there's a reason why they spent $20 million last year in the referendum to push this thing through in the, in the, in the state. So people want to demand it. So, so I just one I'd say, don't assume that someone may say they may be inclined to support the casino. The reason why they incline to support the casino is they really don't know that much about this issue yet. And that's where the work comes in. Oh, I, I'm sorry, yes, yes. So, the, the, so the, the question was, can you reconcile why you know, Brockton has so many Christians, yet so many people are pro-casino? And so my first point is, I think a lot of, I don't, don't assume they're pro-casino. There's just a lot of misunderstanding about this issue. People don't understand it. This is, this is really the only issue I've, I've ever encountered as someone who worked in public policy, where the more you learn about it to a person, the more you become strongly opposed. And so that's why they, that's why they, they, don't, they don't want to have a lot of sunshine on this. They want to have everyone have a very superficial understanding of this. So don't assume, if you go out and do the work, you will educate people. You, and the key, the phrase I always use is you have to talk about it in a way that connects with people's conscience. So, so that people will, over time, people will learn. I mean, community after community have, have thrown these things out. You know, they defeated them because they, they did the work. And you can defeat this in this town. There's enough talent in this room where you can do that. Um, yes, ma'am. I have a copy of the host city agreement here in front of me. And section A talks about a comprehensive study that's supposed to take place about the mitigation of traffic, 
infrastructure, utility stress. It's supposed to start, according to this agreement, the study, immediately after this agreement was signed, which was in February. How do we, as informed voters, know what this developer will pay for in terms of impact on our community? Because we're going to vote on May 12, but the negotiation on what they'll pay for doesn't take place until after they get the license. Yeah. Most of you hear that question? Yeah. It's a pretty good setup, isn't it, for them? Right? <laughs> that's, what, that's how they want it. This is a business that's based on deception. This, this, the whole casino business is based on thinking you have a chance to win and that this is, this is an even thing. This is a rigged, they have rigged games. This is a rigged process. So they don't want you to have that study. If they, if they wanted that study, you would have had a long public process here, a long public debate, okay? So you, you, need, you need to demand the independent evidence, evidence but they're not going to provide. They make maybe a couple days before even, you know, they might kick something out after they spent, you know, a million dollars in the city deceiving people into a whole nother narrative. But you just need, what, what can an informed voter do is keep raising your voice, enlist other people, talk to your friends. That's you got you to do the work and educate people on this issue. So there's, unfortunately, there's no simple answer. It's just doing the work and educating folks. But, ma'am, behind you, yes. I, am, I don't know if I have a question, but I have a statement for the and all that, how in the world does this community even think that this would be feasible and any good for this community? I am appalled that our politicians, our elected officials, are in favor of this. And I hear you why you're appalled, and you should be appalled. You should be, you should be have a rage for justice on this. Yes. Okay. But, but you need, they need to hear from you. Okay. They need to hear from you. And, and a lot of them are going to tell you. I, I saw some of the quotes. I, I, you know, we're a national organization, so I don't see every story. But I saw some of the stories. Some of the counselors would be like, well, I'm not sure how I stand, but, you know, we'll let the people vote on it. Okay. What that means is, as someone who's seen, I've seen, you know, 50 referendums in this country on this issue. When casinos stand up and say they want to, you know, we want a referendum. You know, let the people vote, or you know, what they're saying is, it's not let, it's not let the people vote. It's let us buy the vote. Okay? It's not like there's going to be a real debate. They're going to be dropping a million bucks in this community. So the way, and the, you can beat that by getting out. And you, the great thing in today's world is with all these forms of media that's out there, you know, Facebook, social media, email networks, neighbor, like you can get your message out. You don't need to be a millionaire to do it. You just got to do the work. But, but that's, you, you should be appalled, and you should you exercise that rage constructively and get out, exercise your power. Ma'am in the back, yes. Have the power to change it. So this is one of the keys. As someone who worked in politics, you know, I used to think you work, you know, you work, the power is if you go out and you can, you work outside the existing 
political structure and you go out and you organize your community, your, your neighborhoods, your, any social groups you're part of, talk about this and spread, you have the power to do this. You just, once you, you've talked to, each of you talks to 50 people in this community, you know, all that's going to start trickling out, you know, up, up to the, the powers that be. But you could, forget what they, turn. Right. Agree. So I guess the general point is, after May 12th, like, win or lose, this doesn't I mean, if, if you win on May 12th, that's the end of it. And, and you have the power to win on May 12th. But, but even if you lose on May 12th, the fight goes on. It goes on. Isn't the end of May 12th if we go in? It's just the it's, 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 it's pre, and to use an NFL terminology, it's just preseason. You know, it's preseason. Even if they win on May 12th, you're in a lot. You should fight like crazy to May 12th. But you, you're in this for the long haul. And day after day, you're gonna you keep shutting them down. Middleborough had this fight for years. They, they you wear people down. You because you're, you're, you're on the right side on this. There's no black. There's no gray area. It's black and white. The facts are on your side. You're just gonna keep doing the work. Yes, sir. <laughs> This is an important conversation, and I think it doesn't all, you know. You're not going to have all the answers tonight, but what needs to happen is you develop a movement of citizens that from nonpartisan. That, you know, you, you don't talk about other issues. This, you, this, is, this is the most unique coalition in the United States. We're, on our national board, we have people from the political right, political left, and everyone in between working together on it. Because we have some shared values as a people. As much as people try to split us apart, that we have some shared values on this issue. Okay? And so in your, in your, in your city, you know, don't cut anybody out, work with everybody. But what happens is you're going to build a movement. So part of a movement, you know, there's really four aspects to every, every movement. There's litigation. So what else you can do? So I, one, you can start raising some money, get an attorney to file some legal uh, uh, action if you think some public process has been violated or whatever. You have a legal program. You have, um, you push the council, like they call it a legal, a legal strategy, where you, meaning you, meaning litigation, meaning you're doing lawsuits. You have a, a, a legislation strategy where you're pushing through, you try to fight at the council level. You have what's called direct action or demonstration where you protest, you hold signs, you, you do you know, sit-ins, whatever you want. You take actions that confront and awaken people's conscience about this issue. And then lastly, the fourth thing is you educate people. You know, ed and forums like this, distributing li literature. In your, so those are four ways, and, and it's, it's developing a strategy in those four areas. But there's, there's no easy, it's, it's just doing the work. So, there's lots of steps that you can do. I think as a community, you need to come up with a, a specific plan as citizens how to fight that. But there's a, there's a lot of talent in the state of citizens groups that have done that. I'm happy to partner. And, you know, I, I invited some of them here tonight to partner with you, but there's, there's a lot of knowledge that can be shared and help, help you fight. But I hope you stay involved from, from, you know, from here going forward. Yes, ma'am. I hear what you're saying about this really being a political campaign. And that's the way it has to be treated. We, the people who oppose it, have to develop a real strategy. And one of the things I'm concerned with, it, it actually it was uh, Bishop Texera's comments about how do we reconcile Christianity to gambling? Why do so many people gamble? Well, that is a long story, I'm sure. The point is, Christians do gamble. And there are a lot of people who gamble here. It's, we, I suggest that the biggest reason we really don't want it here is because we don't want it here. Yes. It's not because of moral values or anything else. People want to gamble, that's your right. But we don't want it in a city that is so small geographically, in the center of the city where the poorest people are. And I really think that has to be a big issue besides the fact that it's right beside the high school. There is no way the traffic can ever be mitigated no matter how much money they put in it. You can't do it. We can't even get two-way traffic on Main Street for how many years now? <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so what she's talking about is really the, those local impacts, and, and that's a powerful argument. You, it, the data shows that to pass a casino it, next to a landfill, Landfill and casinos are the two most controversial things to get approved for reasons she talked about, okay? Because it, once you look at it, having in your town, 
you know, people don't want it. So some people call it NIMBY, whatever, but I, it, it, your point is valid. And I think, but, so, but different, different messages resonate with different folks. So the key is, but, but you could develop that message, it's just not right for Brockton, however you frame it. But I think that's a conversation that as a group, everyone in this room going forward needs to, to, to commit to. But that's absolutely, you're right on, right on the mark with that. Yes. For those who uh, wrote out your questions, we didn't want to lose that. But ironically, or helpfully, they're questions that can be posed in subsequent meetings this week uh, because they really can be directed at the Thursday evening meeting with the, uh, sponsored by the counselors. But I thought, let, given your travels and hearing other cities, you might have some. Uh, I mean, one question is, how could they think of it when Route 24 is considered a worst highway in the state, there are no roads, that the traffic, it's a general, several questions related to um, addressing the whole issue of traffic. Well, I guess every, I, they, because this, at the end of the day, if you're Neil Bloom, you don't live here, you really, you don't care, you know? There's a reason why they're spending a million dollars to, uh, you know, so on these campaigns to tell you a phony narrative. At the end of the day, they're gonna talk about you, I mean, what are they going to do? Of course, they're not going to rebuild Route 24. They'll give you a, that's it. So they're not going to fix it. So, I mean, so I, to answer your question, they're not going to solve your traffic problem. It's definitely going to get worse. Okay, no question. Uh, wait, hold on. A second. You want there's more? Is that is that how, so I'm saying they're going to talk all you want. They're not going to fix your your traffic problem. And that's what happened in East Boston and all these other places, and they defeated it. Yeah, gotcha. And there are a number of questions relating. We already have a shortage of police officers in Brockton. How many new ones? But the whole issue of, uh, of security and crime and things like that, there's a broad uh, it, yeah. subject. Yeah, why don't you, why don't you stay through it? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, inevitably, your police force is going to need to get, you're going to have, you know, it's, crime rates aren't going to go down in Brockton, you bring this in, okay? They're going to they're gonna talk about, well, the, the um, police chief in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania said this is a, was a good thing. We didn't see. Ask for the FBI statistics. Okay, don't ask for the opinion of the local police chief whose funding is, 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 is coming in from the casino. Okay? But that's what you hear. I talk to, you know, we're part, they're working, they're all the locals are local guys, and they're well-meaning, they're working, they do extra details about the customer. They're not going to speak out on this. Okay? Ask, look for the, ask for the FBI data. Okay? But there's no question, you know, especially white-collar crime, embezzlements, all that stuff, that's where it's, it's the property crimes that are huge. And I think that, for you coming tonight, it's sort of like somebody outside the gate that bringing in national expert, experts, making ourselves local experts. Um, and it looks like there might be a question. Yeah, gentlemen back, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know they're gonna put it in there soon, right? But um, are they concerned about where they're gonna, like, is it gonna be near the school, or if my daughter goes there and she doesn't walk, but if she did, I mean, what are they gonna do, like, as far as, like, yeah, security? Yeah, the superintendent wants it. Not stopping kids from going in there and gambling, or, you know, just, Bring in a, I don't know, CD crowd. You know what I mean? Like they have a bad enough time getting in and out of there in the afternoon and in the morning. You know, as, as, a, as a parent, I don't see the, the logistics of putting it across the street from a high school. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a moral issue right there. Yeah, I mean, you're you're going to be corrupting people's I, children that are under A city that calls itself the city of champions doesn't build a casino across the street from its high school. You just don't. Um, and I'd, I'd kind of like to get you on the record on this, because I think when we heard that, well, of course, there's 45 acres, which is the footprint. It actually matches the footprint of the high school at the fairgrounds. And we thought, oh, did they notice there was a high school across the way? Then Frank Ferenkopf's quote in this book which we're making sure that if you can and will, for uh, some of you, the, this outlines a fact, and it quotes Frank Ferenkamp, who is the former CEO of American Gaming, that the young adults are the future. And so is it possible that on a GPS or a Google map, they said, oh, high school, hey, this will work fine? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the, I mean, you know, I don't know if that was the real, I just think they're looking for a, a great piece of land that can get access. I mean, I, if, I, if I was a, one of these, you know, $100,000 a year consult, political consultants for the casinos, I, I don't think their ideal spot was the high school in terms of that sense. I think it's just a great piece of land. I don't think they care the high school's there, you know. But, yeah, but, 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 they do, but they do want those kids ultimately in that casino. That's the goal. 
Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter because all the students that go to Brock High School, they're minorities, they're black and brown people. Therefore, the mayor doesn't care, the president doesn't care, nobody cares. So we are going to go to jail no matter what, they better do right now in Brockton. That's what's happening in Brockton. So let's be honest on the record. They're building a casino by the high school because it's black and brown people who go there, white kids are not there. Or if they are, they're, they're smallest, or they're poor just like us. Nobody cares for us. It's true. Can you imagine them building a casino across the street from Newton North High School? I mean, think about it. That's what, and this is a question. I, before I did this, I said, this is a calling for me. I, I'm from Lawrence. For seven years, I was the chairman of the planning board in Lawrence, OK? And I was just to wonder, all these junky projects used to come in for us before. And Lawrence is, even, is poorer than Brockton, OK? We used to have all these projects, junky projects. Why, they wouldn't build this in their own community. Like, why would we do it here? Like, it was just incredible to me that we'd settle for this, OK? Don't settle. They wouldn't do it at Newton North. If it's not good, if they wouldn't build a casino across from Newton North, don't do it in Brockton. We'll take a couple more, but also uh, the question of, of unions and touting the whole that. And I asked, I would also ask you if there's any question we haven't asked that you've heard a lot and you expected but didn't get. Sure. Joe, sure. I'd love to talk about the, the labor issue, the labor unions who support this. And if there's nothing, some of the last 10 years, it's one of the saddest things about this issue, is to see rank and file in the leadership of, of some of the labor unions, not just in, in Massachusetts, but across the United States, stand up and, and support a business that extracts wealth from other working people. It's one of the saddest things about it. So how, how do you talk about it? Well, what I, a couple of things, how I deal with that is this. These are jobs, you know, so, so, so say the 600 construction jobs, or whatever they say, they're gonna be here. These are jobs that create inequality, okay? Casino jobs are jobs that create inequality. They create poverty. So they create, they're, these are jobs that are dishonest. So, so they're making a buck, but, it's, but these, some of these labor guys are making a buck, but it's, these are dishonest jobs, okay? They're hurting people by doing it. But I, but I, but I, was gonna, I come from the city of Lawrence, and, and you know, we're not this, we don't call ourselves the city of champions, okay? I'd love to be able to call us the city of champions, but, which is your logo. Or your brand is as it should be. But Lawrence is, is known for a major thing that happened about 100 years ago. And some of you may know this, you know your labor history. There was a strike called the Bread and Roses strike. Okay? Bread and Roses. So those of you who you know, are not familiar with it, what, what it meant was you know, all these immigrant folks, it, it, huge tech, Lawrence was a huge text, text, textile city at the time. You had all these poor folks in January, in January, freezing cold weather, walked off their job and were out for days. Okay, it became a national story, and they call it the Bread and Roses strike. And you know why they call it Bread and Roses? Okay, think about it. Bread and Roses, what does that mean? It means jobs with dignity. Okay, jobs with justice. Okay, that's what the, you see, you hear know, labor guys talk about, they want jobs with justice. Who doesn't agree? We want, everyone wants jobs with justice. Casino jobs, whether you work inside the casino or whether you're building the casino, they're jobs with injustice. Jobs with injustice. And, and, and part of the reason why these labor guys need, because we've given them the scraps. Instead of pr producing a real, real economic growth for people, for working people, you know, we're ripping people off with all kinds of, whether it's casinos or other forms of, of, the, of these other businesses, putting to keep people into, into poverty. So I understand why they want the jobs, but they need to pause. It hurts all of us when they, when they push this stuff. This is it jobs with injustice? Can I ask a question about the money? $10 For instance, in Foxwood, is that town getting any money anymore from that casino because they're not making any money? Sure. So, so that, that's it. Well, I've got the details between different kinds of casinos. But what's different between what's proposed here in Brockton versus, say, Foxwoods is Foxwoods is technically what they call a tribal casino. So it's owned by, it's owned by a Native American tribe. So, so, th so they have a direct relationship with the city, uh, the state of Connecticut, where they give, like, I want to say 25% of their slot revenues to the, to the state. So th here it's, it's a different situation where, you know, you, they're, in order to get this bill through the legislature, they had to offer all these carrots. And one of the carrots is, well, if you're going to build a casino in a town, they gotta, the town needs to get a, some of the dedicated revenue stream to entice the town to take it. Because otherwise, who would I casino if they weren't going to get money from it, right? That's why, that's why Brockton's doing this. I mean, they want the, the, Oh, they don't do well at all. Of course, it's a ripper. You're not going to... Yeah. yeah. The tribal members from New Foxwood are getting checks of $100,000 a month. 
thousand. Now again, now again, now again, zero. Yeah, that's nothing. Like the whole thing. It, it's like it's like those people. Ten, you know, seven or eight years ago, they were selling prime, uh, selling subprime loans to people who couldn't afford them. Remember that? Right. That is the same. It's phony prosperity. It's a gimmick. It's it's built on sand. Okay, it's built on, and you have the power to stop it. Great. Let's give him a hand. All right. Thank you. So on behalf of everybody, I'll, I'll thank Les for making his way here. And uh, just know that going into the StopPredatoryGambling.org is an opportunity to see other videos that are on YouTube. And hopefully this one will be as well. So we have three things to do in the next 10 minutes to wrap things up. Uh, in addition to a prayer. Uh, Pastor Reed from North Baptist Church is going to give us about five minutes to rev us up on the materials. We're all part of Stand Up for Brockton, which is a, a means, a coalition of getting us to really carry out what Les is talking about. So I introduce Pastor Reed. Then uh, Isabel will talk about a meeting on April 14th that's following on. And, uh, and then, as I say, we'll talk about materials that you can look at on your way out. All right, it started off at five to ten minutes, and now it's down to five minutes, and I've got, as less was going on tonight, my, t my amount of things was growing and growing and growing. Um, as of 10 a.m. this morning, there were 48,709 registered voters in the city of Brockton. I have all their names. 48,709. It is imperative if you are a U.S. citizen and you have not registered to vote, you must do so by April 22nd, 8 p.m., so that you would have an opportunity to vote on May 12th. That's imperative. Now, I looked at our city's website and I found some very interesting things there. There is nothing about this vote on this website except for one line in a PDF file under the Elections Commission that simply says on May 12th there's a special election. Doesn't say what it's about, doesn't call it a referendum. I also noted that this past September with the primaries, of the 48,709 registered voters in Brockton, only 6,707 voted. It's imperative for us to start educating our neighbors. That's our job. When we leave here tonight, we need to talk to our neighbors, talk to our family members, talk to our friends, get something in their hand, get something in there that tells them to vote no on May 12th. There's a whole slew of reasons why this is not a good thing for Brockton. I'm one of those citizens that does not get to vote because I'm not a citizen of this country. And so I am counting on every single one of those 48,000 to get out there and vote no for this. Now, I will help in a way that I can help. I will educate. I will produce materials. We'll make things available so that people can know what's going on. We have done this, uh, I don't know, if you're a registered voter, probably on Saturday, you received a piece of mail from Yes for Brockton. All right? That mailing went out to all 48,709 registered voters. Did you notice how colorful it was? Very well done. That was expensive. I did some pricing for us. If we wanted to send out a single page flyer with no envelope, just folded over a piece of tape on it and a, a stamp with a special rates from the post office for to do that, our investment would be $17,000. That what they sent out? I quoted it at Staples as to how much that would cost. Over $85,000 to mail that out. We are against people with very deep pockets. I don't know about you, but you know, when I open up my wallet, you know, moths fall out. All right? But we're not rich, we're poor. But you know, we need to make an investment, not only of our time to come to meetings like this, but investment of our time 
telling others. And yes, we may need to invest a few dollars. Now, we've designed a couple, you see one of them up here? Lawn signs. Now, you know when there's an election, there's lawn signs everywhere. I mean, these guys spend a ton of money to be able to make sure that their name is right there in front of you everywhere you go. The Yes team have started doing this as well. They have plastered over by the fairgrounds. Every section of the chain link fence has one. I drove over there the other day, took a picture of it, and I almost put one of my signs in there. We will get one in there. But you know, we need to get these. These things are $15. They're professionally done, and guess what? They're made locally in our area. That's important because, you know, we're talking about all these jobs. Uh, it's imperative for us to let people know what's going on. Uh, we talk about the traffic. Yes, that's a nightmare. Uh, just that one corner where the fairgrounds are, uh, the Department of Transportation says that there are 13,000 people that drive through there every day, 13,000 vehicles. Just up the street by the shopping centers there, uh, the grocery stores that are there, it's up to 30,000. That section, that main intersection of 123 on Route 24, daily 103,000 vehicles. Imagine what's going to happen if we end up with a casino that's going to have to use that same exit. Forget about going anywhere. Find a back road because that's the only way you're going to get there. I think about that $10 million, and it does sound very impressive. $10 million is a lot of money. Our city could use $10 million, but not getting it from a casino. Let's get new businesses here. Business taxes come in. Sell here. Because who is the one that loses? It's the citizens of the community that hosts a casino. Doing a lot of study in the last week and a half. I found an article done by a newspaper that looked at the city of Baltimore, Maryland, and they've just got casinos there. And I'm reading the pro promotional material. The, the casinos in the city of Baltimore are exactly what they're trying to bring in here. They target a particular group of people, people from the age of 65 to 80. They've come out and said it publicly. Can you imagine all of our citizens that are dependent upon their social security and are limited income like that? They can barely make ends meet now. And just think what happens if they lost 10% of that to gambling. All the money leaves states. All the profits go to Chicago. I used to live in Chicago years ago. And uh, we saw the fight that was going on there back then. Oh, one minute? All oh, right. Years, well, I still work in the computer industry as well. And several years ago, I had to work in Las Vegas at a computer convention. And I stayed in one of the small casinos because it was $30 a night. But every morning as I left, I saw people sitting there at the slot machines. And when I came back that night, those same people were sitting there. But you know what the most offensive thing was for me? I had to walk by the pit. And above the pit, there was a sign, pretty much the size of our sign up here. And it said this, cash your paycheck here. That's what will happen. We need to sign some petitions. There's an electronic petition. If you have an email address, on the back table, there's two computers. You can sign up and get on that signature. If you don't have an email address, fill out one of these little forms that are here and I will give you an email address and, and send it in for you. We need to get people to do this. It's imperative for us to stand up what's for right. We need to protect our families. We need to protect every single one of those students, not only at Brockton High, but the elementary school that's not too far away. We need to protect our city from predatory gambling. That was very powerful. Are we ready? Yeah. Are we ready to take an action? Yeah. Are we ready to put our faith in action? Yeah. Okay, so here it is. 
Tomorrow at 6 p.m., we are having the planning meetings where we, are need, where we need to put all these strategies together. The strategies about direct action, the vigils, more vigils and prayer, the citywide hearing is in two days. And we better get over there because otherwise, you know, we gotta be everywhere with our personal testimonies about how this is going to affect us, our community, our families in this city. And the final is to get to the final goal, which is to win voter mobilization, voter power. So we have to come together. The first thing is here. Do you have a pledge card? Please sign it and give it to our, uh, in our table. This pledge card is as you letting us know how you want to volunteer, how you want to put your faith into an action for a no casino in Brockton. Are we ready? Yes. Are we ready? Okay, so the last thing that I want to mention is that do not forget that on the 14th, we're having another citywide, and we hope to have the triple numbers uh, that are in this room. Can you bring a friend to the um, April 14? We're going to be announcing because we are working with the local church, the Methodist where we are in, in West Elm. But if you put your contact information, we're going to notify you where it's going to be at. Yes? yes? All right. Thank you so much. I want to finally uh, ask you to accompany us to the March in Boston. The five for fifteen dollars for everybody. They work for national corporations. We are uh, passing a legislation. We're working to pass a legislation for everyone in this community that makes nine dollars an hour to make fifteen dollars an hour. We are going to be marching in Boston next Tuesday, and the bus is leaving at two p.m. from the Angelos. So please, we have a friend Olga and Ramon who's helping us because we have to keep working to better the life of every family in the city of Brockton. Thank you. Do all of you have this response card? Okay, please, if you don't have one, there are some more on the back. Also, Pastor Reed, there are two computers, laptop computers. If you want to get your name before you leave here on the petition, please stop there. So it just takes a little while, just a few seconds to do that. Also, on the right-hand table uh, where there is, for those of you who got in here a little late, uh, there is by Robert Steele, the, this book called The Curse for $15. Gives you great insight on the, how, how the uh, gaming industry works. Uh, coming into a community. There's also, especially you pastors or any of you leaders, there is a, a free booklet, Why Casinos Matter, 31 evidence-based propositions from the health and social sciences, just real arguments regarding uh, why casinos are not healthy for a community. There is a free booklet there for you, especially pastors, leaders. We may have for anyone who, we may have enough for just for anyone who would like the one. Um, these are downloadable Institute for American Values. The Institute for American Values, if you go to that website, they are downloadable as, as well. A very, very valuable tool that you can speak in an educated manner regarding the real deal regarding uh, casinos. I'm going to ask Pastor Warner to come and close us out in prayer. Um, there's information you can ask Pastor Reed in terms of if you would like to get a lawn sign, how to do that. Um, churches, we would like to see banners. Uh, if you can host a banner at your place, uh, we would love for you to do that as well. Uh, please, the number one thing, the number one thing is going to be every person talking to your neighbor, your friend, your coworker. Um, I would almost ask if I could, just everyone promise that you will do your very best to get at least five people to get out to vote to get out the vote. If you would do that, just please do that. Pastor Warner, come and close us in prayer. Let's all stand together, and I mean that both ways. Let's stand together tonight for prayer and stand together as we do what we need to do for the next month plus and even beyond that.
Pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for the information that we have received here tonight. We wish it were not needed that we get this information. We wish we lived in a different kind of world. But we have to face these issues. And many of us as believers in you feel it's our responsibility to be the conscience of a community. Amen. Consciences are sometimes difficult things to deal with because they are inconvenient. But now that we have this information, we want to leave and put it into practice. We need inspiration. We need to be inspired ourselves. We need to inspire others. We need to feel passion about this matter. We need to feel it, not just for us, but for the generation that will come after us as well. So we ask that you would give us guidance, give us the ability to state our case clearly and without a lot of anger and rancor, but at the same time not to back down, but to speak up and to speak right. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for coming.